Hey guys, Mr. BXRP here and welcome back. Today is June 4th of 2020 and today is going to be a very different video for me today. I want to go through the interview that the Digital Asset Investor did with Greg Kidd um, and, and give you my commentary and my opinions on the interview, the questions, the answers, and what I think what I think I heard throughout the interview. For me, it was the best interview I've ever seen about Ripple and XRP. Um, and, and before we get started, let me just tell you who Greg Kidd is in case you don't know. So Greg Kidd um, is the co-founder of Global ID. If you don't know what Global ID is, you need to look into it. It's a very interesting company. Whether you like what they're doing or not, um, I think they're going to be a big deal someday. He was an early investor in Twitter, in Square. Um, he was an early investor in Ripple, uh, also in Coinbase. Um, so he is an incredibly accomplished guy. And the other thing was... He, uh, he actually was um, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in Payments. So he literally worked for the Federal Reserve's Payment Department. So could you think of a better advisor for Ripple? Because I cannot. Um, quick backdrop, though, to the video. So the Digital Asset Investor mentioned one of Greg Kidd's companies a few weeks ago called Linked2. Linked2 sells an SPV, a special uh, purpose vehicle, um, version of Ripple stock. It's, it's exactly like Ripple stock from what I understand guys except you don't get the voting rights and from what was explained to me by the link to people is that if they allow too many people to sell pure Ripple stock then then it goes to a different security level and, and, and it's a it's it's a difficult thing for Ripple to do but if they allow a company like link to to sell an SPV, which is think of it kind of as a digital version of the stock. Well, then they can do it. So essentially, they can take you know previous employees, existing employees, founders, investors, whatever, who have stock that they might want to sell, and they can sell it as an SPV. Well, when the digital asset investor originally mentioned this company a couple weeks ago, they sold out all of their Ripple stock within a couple of hours. And to no surprise, when he did this interview with Craig Kidd. They also sold out all of the Ripple stock, I believe, that day. Now, the actual interview was part of a day. So the, the day started, and I, and I was there for the entire thing. So, so I was invited to sit in on, on as uh, with the accredited investors. So essentially, they have accredited investors from 11 o'clock in the morning till 5.30 at night, listen to all these companies do their pitch, and then the accredited investors can invest in their companies. It was so cool okay it was really really cool i mean so many different pitches and it was a big emphasis on women in business so it was a lot of women owned businesses or women ceo uh, women ceos in these companies it was incredible i was so happy to be invited i can't wait to to, to sit in on it again and i thank the people from link to to inviting me uh, for inviting me to sit in on it but the end of the day was a digital asset investor um interviewing great kid now the last thing i want to say about it is um, the digital asset investor talked to Greg Kidd days prior to the interview and asked him, look, is anything off limits? And he said, no, ask me whatever you want. So I noticed in social media, 99% of the people loved the interview as much as I did. 1% of the people, you'll never make them happy no matter what you do. Um, but, uh, but listen, Greg Kidd wanted him to ask whatever he wanted to ask. And I think he asked amazing questions. I love the answers. And in fact, link to and Greg Kidd. Um, and just and if I didn't make it clear, Greg Kidd is an investor in Link2. They were so happy with the interview, they invited the digital asset investor back to do it again next month, which I think is amazing. So wanted to set it up. I know this video is going to be a little bit long. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm going to do my best and, uh, and, and go through this with you. So let me jump to the interview. Let's do it. The thing I have to say, I see Ripple. I think Jay said this earlier. I see Ripple as excellent. I see XRP as the oil. And I see Ripple having laid the pipeline since 2012. And Greg, you may not know this, but one time Brad Garland, House the CEO of Ripple, said something that I've never forgotten. He said, XRP is a part of the heartbeat of Ripple. And so my first question is, you obviously own equity in Ripple. Do you also own XRP? I do have uh, quite a stake in XRP. I actually optioned um, 1% of the currency back. 1% guys, for those who are not following along at home, 
um, is 1 billion XRP. So he is a major stakeholder in XRP. Over, over five years ago. So I took a position on 1% of the entire float. So yes, I would say I have some XRP. Is, do you see the XRP in, in a similar manner as being the oil? Well, well I do, that's a good analogy. There's, there's Ripple that has its business model, which is a, an alternative to correspondent banking and SWIFT in the way money has worked uh, between countries, uh, each of which has their own silo. Ripple is a, a ledger that spans all the currencies. And so it's kind of hard to remember, but Ripple was the second digital currency after Bitcoin. And it was the first one that you actually knew who was behind it. I mean, we're all still searching for Satoshi. With uh, Ripple, you knew it was, you know, uh, Arthur Brito, oh, Chris Larson, Jed McCallum, David Schwartz. I mean, they were, they were actual people you could go and see and, and meet and have a beer with. Um, and so it was a company you could join. And yeah, they had their own oil. At the time, it was when it started, it wasn't worth anything. But like ICOs, where they sold it to the public, the first gift of XRP was from its creators. They actually just gave Ripple 80% of it. Um, so this was all pre-ICO, pre-Ether. Um, at the time, we, we knew it was, uh, we didn't know whether it was oil or water, but it was liquid or air. It moved. <laughs> okay, well, here's one for you. Stefan, you, you know, I'm assuming you know. Stefan Thomas was the CTO, and I should have concluded him in that original. He, he was the CTO. He said this. He said, our product ultimately is the currency, the bridge asset. So the question there is, is Ripple successful without XRP, XRP being successful? Well, without XRP, and again, it depends on what you mean by successful. So successful could mean a high price. Obviously, that's beneficial to me. For a guy that has a hundred, for a guy that has a billion XRP, he knows exactly what successful means in XRP. Carry on. The philosophy of Ripple was it just needs to be liquid, right? Because people can get into it and out of it to do things. Now, obviously, if, if you hold it, you want it to be higher rather than lower. But like hog bellies are, you know, they're, they're useful. I don't have a raw stake in the rise of hog belly prices, but if you know, hog bellies are something that's needed for producing a product, you want to have liquid markets. And so for Ripple to be successful, XRP needs to be liquid so there's not friction getting into it and out. That liquidity is, is in many ways, more important than the absolute price, but for those of us that, that, that see it being in demand, well, when there's more demand than supply, the prices rise, and that's beneficial to be on that, that ticket. Right. So one of the major issues that has been in social media, uh, and, and I'm, I'm buried in social media all the time, so we see all of these things, some things that a lot of people don't see, but the whether XRP is a security has been a consistent issue that's thrown out there, I would say, by people who, are, who don't like XRP or don't like what Ripple's doing. I love and his answer to this. Know, you got to listen up. Are, it's, it's almost like a war that's going on about, uh, on social media, Bitcoin versus XRP. Versus, so the question is, can, can Ripple IPO without a declaration that XRP is not a security? Well, and as someone who's going through the IPO process myself, there's, there's going to be a bunch of risk declarations. And um, things can be not a security and then become a security. They can be a security and then become not a security. We heard that specifically from the SEC, that they can be a security, not be a security, not be a security, be a security. We heard that specifically from the SEC. But listen to what he says. I find this very interesting. Right. So that is definitely going to be one of the risk disclosures with the ripple goes out without an SEC determination that it's not or is a security. Um, our, our, the wisdom of our government is, is, is black can be white one day and white can be black the next day. So even if something is declared one thing, there's no guarantee it's going to be that thing in the future. So right. I don't think that's an impediment. I mean, it would be great if the SEC just rolled out the red carpet and said, uh, the Ripple stock is the security and the currency is not, but uh, you know, I don't see that happening. So I, I, I believe that the forward motion is going to be put out of the fifth state. The forward motion 
is going to be without a definitive statement, which means we think you know, which means they're moving forward with or without them announcing regulations. He just said it. It was as clear as it could be. Um, and, and this is kind of along those lines as well. Are we waiting on, because this is a big issue as well, with regard to really all digital assets, but specifically XRP, are we waiting on regulations to be decided or to be announced with regard to XRP? I don't think so. I mean, there, there has been shown a way through the thicket. There has been shown a way through the thicket, right? They're going to move forward with or without. They know exactly what they need to do and how they need to do it. So I don't think the regulations are holding us up like a lot of us think they are. The program obviously didn't do it. The original Libra did not do it. But there are other companies that have done, for instance, what's called a reggae offering, which is a way of having the, the asset actually be a security and get through the red tape for doing that and then have a path becoming not a security in the future. There haven't been any really big name companies that have done that, but the SEC has shown that there's a narrow path to, to getting through this, whether that's the path that the Ripple chooses to go through or not. They're, they're kind of too big to be a, a reggae offering. Reggae offerings have capped at $50 million on the race. So, right? Ripple's out there now. Right, right. Well, um, now also there's the issue of the, the escrow. For, for those that don't know, Ripple has, is it, I don't remember the figures, is it 50, roughly 50 billion in escrow? It's over, it's over 50% of the XRP flow. So, and, 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 I mean, how much is an escrow locked up? Right, locked yeah. up. So they, they keep a proportion, it's like a central bank putting a lock on the gold. I love that. It's like a central bank. So the Ripple escrow is like a central bank. That's just what everyone wants to hear, right? I love it. There's just somebody can't run and just do a raid on the gold, sell it all, and have a party. So they... What about your, the XRP under lock so that the market knows it's not going to be flooded with Ripple selling XRP at any point in time? That creates some, some, you know, some sense of security that, that, that Ripple's acting sort of in the role of like a central bank to make sure that there's no debasement of the currency. Um, now, with regard to that escrow, does Ripple have to disclose prior to the IPO that they have to disclose whether any of that escrow? X, escrowed XRP is only the earmark held in trust or pre allocated in, in any kind of way to any other person or entity prior to that IPO. They have to okay, I'm going to stop this one. All right. Let me first say for, for those who haven't been around a while or those who have forgotten that the XRP price in the last bull run, the bull run of 17 through 18, the 27 days where it went from 23 cents to $3.84, it didn't, it didn't happen until they put the um, XRP in escrow. That's for me what moved the price. People may disagree with me. They may tell me it was technical analysis. They may tell me it was something else. I don't, all I know is when it got locked up is when I saw it start to move and I've heard other people feel the same way. So this question is is really, really, really important. I, having been through IPOs before, everything is disclosed. I don't know if there's a specific requirement for that, but I, I cannot imagine an IPO going forward without a total disclosure about where Ripple stands with all of those issues. So here, here's the point, guys. The 50 billion or 55 billion XRP in escrow. If Ripple has to disclose that when they IPO, and remember that you know when when Brad Garlinghouse announced they were going to IPO, and I think it was around January that he 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 suggested they were going to IPO. They wouldn't be the first. They wouldn't be the last. It sounded like it was going to be in a 12 month period, from what I was told. Um, uh, if they have to disclose. Who owns any portion of that escrow? And a lot of people believe that 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 portions of that escrow have been pre-allocated. It's going to make it very clear to the market how much escrow is really in Ripple's hands and how much is really available. And I think that's going to be key to the future of XRP and and the value is is clarifying who owns that escrow and, and is any of it pre-allocated. So this is big that Greg thinks it needs to be disclosed. And he's been through enough IPOs 
this guy is an expert. He knows what he's talking about. And that's what I think is the beauty of this interview. We've got a real live expert on her, our hands that is behind some of the biggest companies of our time. And now he's involved in the biggest company that we're all we're all invested in their digital asset. And some of us are invested in their company. But but this is fantastic stuff. Um, now, uh, did you, I'm assuming you know Miguel Baez, who's the ex-head of XRP Markets. Um, he, my understanding is that he recently left. Um, now, the most interesting thing that, ha that he has ever said, I love I love the, some of the words that come out of the people that read them because that is what has kept me so fascinated by this company for so long. He said that Ripple had a simple goal of making XRP the world's reserve digital currency. So the question I have is, do you think that Ripple will achieve this goal? Well, I, see, my hopes are, are, are tied up with his, his vision, but, but that's why I joined Ripple. When I joined Ripple, it looked like Bitcoin with two extra columns. Currency and who issued that currency. And so um, I want to live in the Star Trek world. In the Star Trek world, it doesn't matter whether you're a Cleon, a Romulan, Federation, they can all buy dilithium crystals. But you can't do that if your form of value is all in a silo. And so Ripple was the first that, that basically had a, if you will, an intergalactic currency, something that could go everywhere. The, the great thing that Intergalactic currency. I mean, don't you love it? I don't know much about. I didn't really follow Star Wars, guys, um, but uh, it's absolutely incredible where he's going with this whole thing. I mean, Bitcoin had that as well, but in Bitcoin you could only have Bitcoin. In Ripple, you could have both the XRP, but you could also have a representation of all the other fiat currencies. So there was a way in and a way out. So it's not just the chips at the poker table. Ripple built the casino in the window. You can exchange the chips to get into and out of dollars or any other fiat currency. And so, you know, on the goal to becoming the digital currency for the world, having convertibility sounds like a good building block. So he doesn't seem shocked by the question. He doesn't seem surprised, and he doesn't seem taken back by it. In fact, he seems very composed about it. Seems like a logical thing to him, as far as I'm concerned. If Bitcoin was 1.0, Ripple was like 2.0 to me. Looked like it had a better chance, both because of speed, performance, but this ledger that, that had both crypto but also fiat currency. That looks to me like the bridge between the old world and the possible new world. So, again, the jury's out. I obviously decided to take a punt on it. Um, you know, I still remain uh, active and keen in the community. But I love what you just said about. Uh, Ripple creating the casino and the window. <laughs> I like going to the casino and the window. But this next question kind of is in, in line with that, so what you just said as well. And this kind of gives give me what, what your degree of confidence is. And this is a Brad Garlinghouse quote. What we're doing and executing on a day-by-day -day basis is, in fact, taking over Swift. So on a scale from 1 to 10, how close do you think Ripple is to taking over Swift? Well, I mean, there's still a long ways to go. I, 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 I put it like in that, in that process, we're still at sort of a two or three because you can look at how much money is still passing through those old legacy rails, and old habits die hard. I mean, so a lot of you know the people, the people who took any negativity to this interview, which was so small, you know, they just got hung up on the fact of, oh my God, we're at a two or a three. Well, well, the truth is, the banks aren't really using it much at all at if if at all yet it's only the remittance companies i mean guys they're starting with the remittance companies the smaller payments the smaller transactions to build up to the banks the banks aren't coming off the sidelines until there's enough liquidity in the system so the fact that he says two to three don't be surprised and and look if the banks and we don't know how this is going to is going to occur but if the banks all come off the sidelines all on the same day you could go from a two to three to an eight to a nine in one day. We just don't know. You know, the, what a, what I got out of this interview is is, and, and there's much more to go, but but that I want you guys to know. I'm not as concerned about how soon as I am with about how big, how big this is going to be, how big a deal. I mean, this is uh, this is. We, we may be involved in something absolutely 
extraordinary. And we have a person here with a track record, an unbelievable track record of success, and uh, and he's behind it 100%. Um, those coarse-fired banks, they make a tremendous amount of money on the friction that remains within the coarse-fired banking system. And so uh, some banks have gotten on board with, with, with Ripple. Let's be very clear, when you have something that reduces that much friction, um, that's going to cut into... You know, a very exclusive club of banks that have had it very good for them for a very long time. Um, and so it doesn't matter what your technology is. You can have even regulation on your side, but that is a powerful market dynamic to unwind. And so uh, don't know what it's going to take to get to a tipping point. Right? Swift is still the big dog. Right? So Brad, Brad's a hungry, hungry guy. He's, you know, he's a Aggressive. He's got a suit on, but you know he's aggressive. So I, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to handicap that one as above sort of two or three out of ten. Right, right. Well, well, more ways to go. Right. Well, on on uh, another thing that you see a lot in social media, the the the, fra the catchphrase of the anti XRP or anti ripple people is that banks won't use XRP. Will banks use XRP in your opinion? Well, so, you know, we went through this, and one of the, one of the things I saw was, like, banks are going to be kind of like the last one to come to the party. So there you, go. you see who the intermediate solution was. Was that to go to, the, not to banks, but to go to the money transmitters. And so when folks like MoneyGram start using XRP or other folks that are in the money business and are moving money around, they're not as stodgy as, as banks. And, and that's why we're at a two to three, guys. Don't misunderstand this. It's because the banks aren't here at the party. And also just a quick side note, the digital asset investor is is staying on top of these questions. He's not reacting after the answers. Don't think he's not excited or happy about what he's hearing because obviously we've heard he is based on his videos. But he had, like, they gave him 15 minutes and he ended up stealing 26 minutes and I think he got in 12 questions so he's just trying to get the most out of it as he can so that he can get you guys all the questions and answers that he can it was awesome they're not part of the you know correspondent banking voice club right so um there's always going to be folks that are different points on the on the, the, the innovation and adoption curve and you know, and banks despite whatever PR talk they take they're they're very far back on but the money transmitters in the world have been more rock and roll in that, and that's been an easier market to get started in. We're still very, very early on in, in bank adoption. Some of the early banks we, we did just used it because they were multinational, international banks that had different parts. They just used it to move money between their own, you know, their own subsidiaries, right? So that was like the first first usage because they were still having to wire transfer just between their own subsidiaries because there's no way to move money without correspondent banking, even when it's within your own bank. And they could do that without having to worry about persuading the other banks to do it. They could just persuade themselves to do it. Or right. The early use case. Okay, well, the, uh, you know, most of the market to this point has been pure speculation, but I think that everybody would agree that the, the whole concept of XRP is, is that as that as there's more liquidity in the system, that, that, that there is a price rise along with it. What do you think makes it? The XRP price rise. When you take speculation out of it, what do you think is going to make that XRP price rise? Well, there's there's a limited amount of um, XRP in the world. I mean, hundred billion sounds like a big number. But look, what is XRP competing with right now? I love it when he says, you know, there's a limited number. Hundred billion is a big number. The reason why there's a limited number is he knows how much potential use there is for it. And the other thing that he knows is he's holding 1%, 1 billion, and he probably knows a lot of other people that are holding a half a percent, 1%, 2%, 6% of the total supply. So when he thinks about all the people that are holding, that are probably holding long, long term, there's a lot less in his mind of available circulating supply than in our minds, because we just keep thinking 100 million. Let's not forget that that um, um, Mr. Mellon from Mellon Bank, I think he lost uh, a billion XRP when he passed away. 
his family never got the keys to get to the XRP. So as far as I know, there's a billion XRP, 1% of the circulating supply that will never be recovered. First, my banking system. Banks have to deposit money, Moscow, Moscow, all around the world. So there's packs of liquidity. So things can move from one side to another. The way that all works is with pre-funded liquidity. And all that pre-funded liquidity happens in all the different fiat currencies of the world. So if you really want to be able to service money all around and move it, you've got to have all these pre-funded pots and all these different currencies. But if you could agree on one currency and one that you could replenish, not just nine to five, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you need less liquidity because you can see that when you're getting low, you can restock. And how long does it take to restock? Three seconds. How much does it cost to restock? Less than a penny. And so the advantage of XRP is it's a much more efficient method of moving liquidity around. It would be like having a, an engine that ran on a teacup of oil rather than a gallon of oil. Everything still needs liquidity. Pre-funding is great, but when you can top up your pre-funding in three seconds, you need a lot less oil in the engine, in the engine of oil. And, and that's what Ripple brought to the world. Are you saying that a lot of that no straight money one day is going to be in XRP. Is that the ultimate goal? Well, it's going to be replaced. It's going to be replaced by XRP. And so that just that demand for the, the, the thimble of oil, like that thimble is pretty big. And so if all the banks need just enough XRP to handle their liquidity requirements, and you also have money transmitters doing it, maybe even just major corporations are doing it as well. They're just posting their own liquidity around. Everybody needs less liquidity than they needed Nostro and Nostro fiat currency, but that's still a lot of practical need for an XRP. And so I think Ripple's done some of those calculations of each bank around the world and each other regulated financial institution had just enough XRP for their liquidity needs. That would create amazing practical demand. They've done the calculations, guys. You just heard it. Ripple's already done the calculations. If they care if the banks were going to replace their Nostro accounts with XRP and they held XRP, they figured out how much demand there would be on XRP. They've done the calculations. I didn't say that. Greg Kid just said that. For, for, for XRP all just like there's only 21 million bitcoins, if people want to have that in their portfolio, as a as like a, a defensive asset, by the time all the different retirement funds, hedge funds, individuals buy, just have a little bit of extra of Bitcoin tucked away, that creates an overall aggregate demand for Bitcoin. Same is true for Ripple, although its purpose is not just like as a panic currency; it's for a very specific task, creating an alternative. I've never heard that before. <laughs> It's not a panic currency. So, so I assume he's suggesting that Bitcoin is a panic currency. That's interesting. I've never heard that statement before. Very interesting. The heavy liquidity needs for the current Nostro Nostro system of corresponding banking. And and we are talking trillions. Yeah, there's trillions. And this is this is this is the huge kind of dead weight loss in the economy when you have money tied up. Just so you don't run out when you're trying to like move funds from one country to another. It's just it's a dead weight drag on society to have a huge amount of our liquidity tied up in Nostra Nostra accounts around the world. Greg, have you ever have you ever read or heard of the Hodor blog in the XRP community? I have not heard of the Hodor blog. That, that's okay. quite a name. Well, yeah, well, Hodor is named after the guy from Game of Thrones, if you watch that. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. But Hodor is a very smart guy that was in the XRP community. He wrote a blog. And the reason I know that Rick was paying attention to this blog is because he's the only guy in social media that Brad Garlinghouse has said, I read that blog. I'm going to read something to you that this guy said. And I want to see how crazy you think it is or it's not. He said, and he's talking about the one percent, in other words, the top one percent of wealth in the world. He says there might be a day very soon where this one percent translates into the classical. Like, and he's talking about one percent XRP in all of this as well. Okay, this one percent translates into the classical notion of the one percent. 
the upper echelons of personal net worth. Is that cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs to you, or is that in, in a scenario? And, and you, I'm going to give you the in a scenario where your swift answer is not a two, and it's a an eight or a nine. For those of you that were watching the video and you're not driving or doing anything, the look on Craig's face was unbelievable when he's as he's asking this question. That scenario is that a crazy statement. Well, so again, I, I'm ex Federal Reserve. I, I worked at the Board of Governors in the payments group, and you know, but it's been 15 years since I was there. If if I was there now and somebody told me that like in the future. U.S. government's going to be, you know, a trillion here, three trillion there, um, printing money. Um, I, I wouldn't believe it. Now, we live in that reality. I'm not making a political or social statement as to whether that's good policy or bad. But when you have the other forms of value you know, being printed with sort of like no no end in sight, it does suggest that maybe you should have some portion of your Net worth is something that, that is very difficult to debase. And obviously, if you're like one of those one percenters, it's, it's kind of an easier thing to do to do that. And, um, but you know, in, in society, people have, historically, they always tuck some gold away somewhere, or put some cash in the mattress, and, or had a traveler's check tucked tuck away in their, uh, in their wallet. Um, why wouldn't you have some portion of your net worth? Tied up in an asset that, that may be inflation and debasement proof. So it's been, it's been a great talk, right? And hey, God, this is AI. I, 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 we really appreciate it. We're, we're going over time a little bit here, but we Bill, can I ask one last question? We please, please it is highlighted. Last question. Uh, did you see Greg's video? <laughs> <laughs> One more question. He's like, "What is the question going to be?" Bill came here to end the end the interview because it, it went way over time already. It went ten minutes over time, and and Greg's look on his face when he said one more question. And now that the digital asset investor is going to ask him if he's ready. Wait till you see his his facial expression when he asks if he's ready for this last question. Okay, uh, Greg, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you said a minute ago that Brad Garlinghouse um, was, you know, he's an aggressive guy and all that. Well, the reason I've been studying Ripple for so long and, I, and it's kept my attention is because it's not just Brad Garlinghouse saying these things. I want to read two or three things here that they said and then ask you a question. Because words mean things. I've learned that at age 46. This is Navin Good Doug Ripple. He says, Ripple is not an ordinary company. We are not here to have a small market share and make a small amount of money. We are here to make a dent in the universe. And Brad Garlinghouse has referred several times to Ripple as creating what will be a new world order. Miguel Valles, he said that they, the goal was to have the liquidity and XRP of a G10 currency. And then Chris Larson said that he thinks XRP is going to become like the Singapore dollar or the Swiss franc. Evan Schwartz said that the addressable market, these are all guys that work for Ripple, yep. did work for Ripple. He says the addressable market size is, I quote, all of the money. So the question is, against that backdrop, am I right in thinking that Ripple and or XRP could be the greatest investment opportunity of my lifetime? Is that <laughs> well, I can never talk about investment, but I just remember when I was playing a poker game and somebody described what Ripple was to me. And I heard, felt like Moses coming down and saying, Well, there's this concept of a universal ledger. One le a universal ledger. I, I never heard it put that way, but it's really a great way to think about how, um, how XRP and Ripple could um, handle all the money, as we hear all the time, is a universal ledger. I absolutely love it. For all the value in the world, and it has both the new form of value, but it also has a representation of the old forms of value. And that sweeping statement and scope, I mean, I didn't think I was going to go back into the workforce. That's probably uh, the last time I, you know, in the last 20, 20 or 30 years where I said, well, I got to go, I got to go down and meet those guys and talk about them and get me a job because I want to be 
part of that grand experiment. It is an experiment at that scope, which asks the question of what would happen if we did have a universal ledger. And so this is one of those gambles. It's, it's, and, and again, my history has been involved in things that like have been kind of go through the fences type, type place like Twitter, like Square. So, so Ripple is one of those and you know, it could be a disaster, but, but it's like that scene in Armageddon when Steve Buscemi is like hooked up for the asteroid. It looks like the whole world's going to end. And he's like, like he's not concerned with whether the world's going to end or not. He just wants to have a really good spot to see whether it's going to be like saved or end. And I can't think of a better way for me than working there, but I've enjoyed just investing because it's kept me curious. It's made me be interested and really exciting to, to know that folks like you are out there are like, you know, in the hunt and on the journey. But, but I, I certainly cannot predict. I'm not allowed to predict. Right. Well, I'm ready to rule them all. Thank you. Really. Hey, Greg, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Thank you. And we invite you both back next month. Is our, our next month's theme is going to be on blockchain. Unbelievable. So great. So great. I, I absolutely enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed some of my commentary. And that's it. I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an accountant. I'm not impatient. And I'm not a crypto expert. These are my opinions only. Don't make any financial decisions based on anything I say. This video was intended for entertainment purposes only. Please like and subscribe. Hey, if you haven't subscribed, please give me a sub right now. I'm getting ready to hit 14,000, and you can help me if you'd like to. And, uh, and share my videos with anybody who you think might appreciate them. And everyone, have a great day. Bye-bye.